The Mega City is a reality, and it looks a lot like the visions of science fiction films. Giga Cities are soon to be. In the midst of this cold, bleak vision of the future, we have the human being. It is personal, warm, social. Nobody knew that the way we built cities had any influence on lifestyles and people's life. I think we made a lot of the uh, same mistakes as the uh, Western countries has made. We're living in a world that's choked with traffic everywhere, where we've made our own human living environment deadly for people. You actually walking towards a chaos created by yourself. City planning has been going on for quite a number of years with a rather incomplete toolbox. To refocus all of those engineers and planners, you needed new quantitative tools. And that's what Yen helped us do. Get the baseline data, set some targets, now let's plan our street to meet them. Giving people just a little bit of a taste of like what their lives could be like if the space were designed for them. What? Times Square has no square. 89% uh, of it isn't even a square. We needed to change the math. Melbourne was in fact dying. Almost no population living in the city. And we were asked to write a strategy for change. And all we did was listen to the people. But actually I thought the sidewalk had gone through here as well. Uh, at one point. It had been changed to... They changed it back? Yeah. Life comes when you give people a chance to contribute something. People need spaces to come and, come and do that kind of thing, to just come and dance. If you see life, if you see how it goes, then when you grow up, you will take care of lives of others. So when we turn a city into a place where you don't walk, your kids don't walk, you are raising generations when they grow up they will be not human. Now we have started the journey. Now we are in the middle of the bridge. Now I can set up my journey, okay? Which way I can go? Hello and a very warm welcome to all of you, uh, to those of you who have joined us on Zoom, uh, YouTube and Facebook. It's great to have all of you at the seventh edition of the Urban Lens Film Festival. Uh, we've had to go online this year uh, because of the COVID pandemic, but uh, as you're all aware, uh, conversations have been a very, very important part of the Urban Lens Film Festival. Um, and today we're joined by uh, Andreas Dalsgaard, who is the uh, director of the Human Scale. Um, but before we get into uh, the film and uh, the conversation, I'd like to take a moment to thank our festival partners, the Danish Cultural Institute, who have helped to bring the film to the festival and also put us in touch with Andreas uh, for this conversation. 
Um, I hope any of you have had the opportunity to watch the film. It's available online on the Urban Lens website until uh, noon IST uh, tomorrow, 7th December. Um, a little bit about the film. 50% uh, of the world's population lives in urban areas. By 2050, this figure is expected to increase to 80%. The megacity is both enchanting and scary. But how do we plan these cities in a way which take human behavior into account? The 20th century struggle, uh, in the 20th century, the struggle to provide large numbers of people with proper housing, workspaces, and transport led the modernists to create gigantic systems of high rise buildings, industrial estates, and highways. The material gains are evident, but what are the costs? Jan Gale's thesis is that basic human needs for interaction, inclusion, and intimacy were somewhat forgotten during this process. Today, we face peak oil, climate change, and several health issues due to our rapid growth. With an exploding population, we need to double our urban capacity within 30 years. Can a people-oriented planning be the solution? The main question is pressing and includes all of us. From the slum of Bangladesh to the financial district of New York, what is a happy life? And can a city make us happy? What is a good city? Is it made of highways, gated communities, and high-rise structures? Or is it made of bikeways, parks, and walking streets? Can architecture meet our human needs to face uh, in the face of future challenges? The human scale meets thinkers, architects, and urban planners across the globe. It questions our assumptions about modernity, exploring what happens when we put people into the center of our planning. A little bit about the director, Andreas. Andreas M. Dalsgaard graduated from the National Film School of Denmark as a fiction film director in 2009. He has degrees in visual anthropology. Um, Afghan Muscles was Dalsgaard debu Dals Dalsgaard's debut as a documentary director, and it became a festival hit, winning Best Documentary at AFI Los Angeles and Open Eyes Award at the Rome Med Film Festival. His film Cities on Speed, Bogota Change, was selected for reflecting images at IDFA and won the Audience Award at Indy Lisboa in Portugal. The short film Copenhagen was Dalsgaard's graduation film as a fiction director. Dalsga made a documentary fiction hybrid called Traveling with Mr. T, co-directed by Simon Lering Wilmont, which is produced by Final Cut for Real. So Andres will be uh, in conversation with Krishna, uh, my colleague from IHS, who works on urban spatial analysis research. His current focus is on developing methods for fine-grained population and socioeconomic mapping to understand spatial inequality in Indian cities, particularly in the context of urban water resources. In Bengaluru, he has been working on methods for mapping population at 30 meter resolution, uh, analyzing, inequality in uh, analyzing inequality in access to domestic pipe water supply and estimating urban groundwater budgets. Krishna also has a design practice which currently focuses on small scale residential projects. He tries to make these residences as energy and resource efficient as possible. At IHS, Krishna supports research and practice projects and is also involved in teaching for the Urban Fellows Program and the Urban Practitioners Program. Thank you both very much for being a part of this conversation today. Krishna, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, Yasho. Uh, Andreas, it's really a pleasure to be able to talk to you today about the film. I really enjoyed it. Uh, the film is also especially interesting, I think, because as Jan Gale talks about it, uh, the kind of urban transition which happened in the 60s, we are in some senses seeing that in Indian cities today. And as the, kind of the film uh, notes, modernism in many ways seemed to have a kind of a simplifying approach towards all sorts of complexity within cities in terms of the physical structure of cities, but also I think um, in terms of environmental and other social complexity in many ways. So maybe we can start by discussing a little bit about what got you interested in this specific topic and how you initiated this whole process of this film. I've for a long time been interested in how the idea of modernism has shaped our lives in the last hundred years. And a lot of the work that I do is dealing with how ideas can basically reshape lives. A lot of the things like cities that we live in, um, we take for granted that 
this is how things are supposed to be. This is a natural development. But ideas play a huge role in, in, in shaping uh, our lives. And if we change the ideas, then, then we can actually um, change cities fundamentally. And that's the sort of foundation of it. And then more concretely, I um, was doing a film like it was mentioned before called Bogota Change in Bogota, which dealt with how this city went from being some of the worst, mega, one of the worst mega cities on the planet to become a model for change and how very few people with very brilliant ideas were able to do that. And some of the ideas that were implemented in Bogota were directly inspired by Jan Gehl, this Danish architect. So that's how I came to know Jan Gehl, even though I'm Danish myself. And there's a certain irony to that because Jan Gehl is, in many people's eyes, maybe the most influential architect today, worldwide, but very few people know his name. And other famous architects like Norman Foster or um, uh, others are, um, are much more well-known names, but that's because they built buildings that we can look at and celebrate and recognize where Jan Gil never built anything. He built principles and ideas and methods that can be applied to cities anywhere. And that's what makes him so influential. So being in Bogota, seeing the difference that his ideas that I've gotten used to in Copenhagen for four decades because they're very influential in how we built Copenhagen over that time. To see those ideas implemented in a place like Bogotá and, and really work was um, what, what got me started on, on this story. Yeah, and film especially, I think, is a, it's a great medium in terms of trying to communicate at least more of the experience of scale. Like because, you know, the scale of you know, cities and spatial structure is something I've been personally interested in. And one of the things I've always felt is that uh, to some extent, the dominance of photography and visual media in communicating and, and kind of, especially photography in communicating architecture and places may also have contributed a little bit to communicating only one slice of it, the visual slice in ways. And as and then on the other hand, some other aspects of experience gets really underplayed. You know, uh, I think Jan Gale has uh, spoken about in some of his other lectures uh, about how his wife, who's a psychologist, asked him, you know, why don't people or architects rather have uh, humans in the photographs they take of buildings? And, and why do you have all these empty you know, views and so on? And I, I think in a way, photography itself and architecture, especially as you mentioned, you know, the, the buildings, the object buildings of the famous architects have been communicated so much through photography as a medium and probably far less through film as a medium. And in this case, it seems like the film manages to capture so much more of that experience at, at different levels, starting from the aerial views and so on. I also wanted to ask you, you know, your experience of traveling to these cities, especially uh, Chongqing and uh, Dhaka. And what that experience of being there, because even the film can capture only one part of that actual physical experience of being in these places. How, how you know how that influenced your thinking about cities, not just in Copenhagen and so on, but also what's happening in cities in other parts of the world, especially developing countries. Well, I, I think Chongqing in China and Dhaka are, um, are two very opposite examples, really. Chongqing is a result of what you can almost call over planning. A lot of Chinese planning is uh, done from um, a high up position in government and then principles are applied everywhere. Mm -hmm. So there's a lack of this sort of organic adaptability to um, the place, to um, the needs of people. And if there's a government directive that says streets should be a hundred meter wide, then streets are hundred meter wide, whether that's sensible or not. So um, there's a lot of planning in, in China that, that's like that. And, and in that sense, you can also see how many Chinese cities become very similar. And the way that Yang Gail works in China is really trying to approach and address the people in government who make those principles, because then you can really make a significant change 
in a very big country. In Dhaka, it's a bit the opposite. The last city plan that was really um, sort of effectively implemented in Dhaka was done in 1972. At a time when I think at that time they expected the city to become a city of a half a million people. Now it's, I think, recent numbers are like 25 million and it's growing annually at a, at a pretty high pace. So you have a situation where, where the sort of grand urban plans are totally out of touch with the reality. And in that sense, the city is really a result of lack of planning. And, and there are good and, and bad things connected to it. The good thing is that people live and work very closely to same places. Most people in that city move within a two kilometer sort of radius. And that means that a lot of commuting, uh, commuting is uh, avoided. You have the rickshaws, the bike rickshaws, which um, I think I, there were 300,000 rickshaw drivers in, this, in, in the city. And that's a very um, organic and uh, environmentally friendly uh, way of transporting. But, um, but the plannings that's being implemented now, oftentimes with the advice of um, foreign engineering companies, or I think the Japanese National Engineering Group is um, advising DACA to build flyovers and to uh, build suburbs and to um, also expand the roads and get rid of the rickshaws. Um, and, and the result really will be quite detrimental because it doesn't deal with the local situation and organically adapt to the potentials there. And, and every place, every city is unique and it's, you really have to adapt and understand the local situation in order to make chains that can improve the situation rather than just increase the problems that are already there. And if you imagine a city like Dhaka where we put people in the suburbs, then um, right now I think it's 4% of the population that own a car. If 20% owns a car or 40%, that city would just break down. Yeah. And, and a lot of Indian cities probably have similar problems. Yeah, it's quite interesting also this question of, you know, what are the aspirations of people? Because uh, in some sense, here we are, st I mean, I'm speaking about India and maybe some other uh, countries which are in a similar status, it's almost like we are in the aspiring to car phase of cities, whereas, you know, many other examples which you talk about and, and show from uh, the, the Western context, it's more like, especially for the affluent people, I think it's more aspiring to be back on the bikes. And on the other hand, when you look at Dhaka and cities in India and so, in India and so on, you, you have a lot of people who bicycle, but then when you look at what is the aspiration of, of a lot of people due to multiple uh, concerns, uh, that it, it's quite a kind of a different scenario. And like you said, it's also interesting uh, what I think uh, David Sim mentions towards the end of the film and he's talking about I think Christchurch about uh, you know how you, you need life to come in organically in, in the cities I think it's David Sim or maybe I'm mistaken but uh, in when looking at it from our kind of settings it almost seems like we have so much of the organic stuff happening that <laughs> sometimes a lot of what people seem to want to do at least what we hear about in the media and all so on is, the, is want to kind of control and order things more. So it seems like we are at different points in a kind of trajectory of, uh, you know, urban modifications and so on. And, and this point about order and efficiency, like you mentioned in the beginning, seems to be you know, very central ideas in, in terms of at least modernist city planning. And then this whole idea of efficiency that the street becomes efficient as far as one thing, which is movement of cars and less so uh, and with less attention paid to pedestrians and so on. And on the other hand, like you mentioned, there's this thing of the land use segregation, which you know over the years there has been so much written against and the, the need to bring together these different land uses so that um, you need to, to, in a way, minimize travel and minimize commutes and so on. But related to that, uh, and uh, connecting back to one of the points you mentioned about the size of cities, in some senses, we're also seeing some unprecedented things. 
which is the scale of cities 20 million 30 million and the need to move people around uh, within these cities becomes in some senses an unprecedented challenge in many ways isn't it and uh, while many of these ideas have a lot of attraction I'm, 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 I was left thinking about you know what happens when the scale of cities itself completely changes to something new well I think we have to um, deal with giga cities um, with some of the same principles and and the principles for example are that there's nothing wrong with a car per se and there's nothing wrong with the aspiration for a car but when it's connected to a lifestyle where you move to a suburb you buy a house or you move into an apartment in a suburb and you transport yourself by a car to work in another part of the city and then leisure is in another part of the city it creates a lot of transport and when you have many people and they all need to transport this themselves the same way, then there's just no way you can build a city model that can accommodate for that. So when we're dealing with giga cities, we have to think of them in terms of basically localities within a, a bigger urban network so that people can enjoy life, leisure, live and work in the same place. So you diminish the amount of transport, basically, because transport is the biggest issues issue here. And the more we force a city model where people have to transport a lot, the more we need roads, the more we need wide roads, the more we need cars and the less space there will be to walk to nature, to um, do what I think many people love doing in cities, which is the whole sort of, you know, urban experience of people and people of different backgrounds and shopping and 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 enjoying life i mean that's that i think is is a very fundamental thing we all we all desire and need so um access to nature but nature can be within the city too trees and parks so um that just becomes very difficult when we um, force that city model onto cities around the globe and we force a model also where people spend two, three, four hours daily in traffic. That's not a very fun way to live. Because what, what really makes us happy is being with other people. It's socializing, it's access to nature, it's that organic stuff. Um, so, so it's really about thinking, thinking in terms of city models that can deliver that. Yeah, and since you mentioned about, you know, transport and how that's one of the big concerns, um, would you also like to share some uh, reflections from the Bogota film which you made? I think it probably focused quite a bit on the BRT system there, is it? Yeah, um, well, Bogota did a, a pretty ingenious thing, which was that um, they, they knew they didn't have money to build a, a metro, underground metro. It would be and is incredibly expensive. And for a city in a, you can say like a developing world kind of city um, with limited financial means, what they did was that they built an underground bus system, but with specific, uh, specific lanes and stations, almost like a metro underground. Mm -hmm. And they were able to build the first uh, of those within one year. It, it's a much more efficient way of building a transport system. It costs, I think, 10% of what a metro would have cost. Mm -hmm. And through this system, they were able to connect many parts of the city into a very efficient system that I think today transports up to 2, billion, two million people daily in Bogota. Mm -hmm. So that was a way to, um, to basically find um, a working um, compromise that could, um, to understand the fabric of Bogota, then one end of the city, the south, is the poor part, mm -hmm. north is the rich part. So you have a big commute of people from the south to the north working as servants and maids and, and so on for the rich people. Mm -hmm. So it basically offered them a much more humanly decent way to transport themselves to work. And 
it it cut I think the transport time in half for those people, and um, and in that sense also in terms of equality, it was um, definitely um, a great improvement for many people. Another thing they did was that they tried to uh, legalize a lot of the um, shanty towns in Bogota, a lot of the illegal dwelling. Mm-hmm. Big parts of the city are, are basically um, illegally built. And to instead offer very, very low priced single dwelling houses, it was like row houses that um, came with um, a, f- a system of um, mortgages and um, you could loan the money in the bank with with very little security and this was was basically a way to allow people to own their own house and everywhere around the world this is a huge factor when it comes to building wealth and building security for people to to allow them to become house owners and then within an urban urban fabric where um, it's it's very densely populated in road dwellings but at the same time it's not you don't end up in these modernist kinds of buildings with 20 story high rises and and um, very little street level life. So um, a lot of new areas of Bogota have been developed according to the scheme, which um, I think has improved the lives of, of the lower middle class and the poor people greatly. Um, so there, there are many, um, many interesting things that were done in Bogota that, that, that really also created equality through the way that the city is planned. And we talk a lot about in politics about equality, um, but we don't really talk about it much in terms of the urban experience and how to plan our cities. But at the same time, I think anyone who owns a house knows how much just that one thing means in terms of through life, creating a kind of in, um, wealth, creating um, savings, and and that's that's the prime driver. That's house ownership. The second prime driver is buying cars because there's a whole system of yeah. of sort of um, production of cars, oil, um, selling of cars that's generating money and generating to some extent wealth. If we just remove the car from the system and replace it with the bike. Well, it's, it's not going to improve the GDP of countries, but um, but it might improve people's lifestyle. So uh, then also sometimes you, you have to make a compromise to say maybe GDP is not always that important because it might not improve the lives of people. So it's really about trying to understand also in the case of Bogota, what are Bogota's specific challenges? They may have built a metro in Paris, but it might not be the thing that works here. What can we do here that's going to improve people's lives? Yeah, and these are some serious challenges which Indian cities have also been in some ways grappling with. But although in India, there's been a lot of push for building metro systems, um, very expensive, like you mentioned. Uh, and as we know, even some of the really big wealthy cities like New York are struggling to maintain their metro systems and keep them running and so on after all these all these years um, really to the point you mentioned about equality and so on and also going back to the Christchurch part of your film where you know there's a, a little bit of uh, video footage about the a kind of a charade where everybody comes together brings ideas to the table uh, I was wondering you know any thoughts on you know whose voice gets heard in these kinds of settings you know especially when you consider a Christchurch versus a Bogota versus other places because in some ways if I were to caricature our experience here it seems like the affluent seem to have such a major voice in some of these decisions in many different ways through influence social networks all kinds of things um, so any any thoughts on that given the different cities that you um, filmed in and experienced? What I think was interesting with the um, example of Christchurch more than anything was that they did this model when they had to rebuild the city after the earthquake, where they um, developed a concept called share an idea. And citizens were basically asked to come and share an idea about what would you like in the city? And I think there were more than 100,000 ideas and it was pretty um, methodically mapped in terms of 
which ideas were mostly prominent mm -hmm. um, and so on. Um, the main sort of power of this was to have another argument to use against the affluent people or the um, big uh, companies that, that built because they don't necessarily, when they look at, at their econ economy, um, think about this. In the case of Christchurch, they wanted to re-implement a city model like the one they had before mm -hmm. with a lot of urban, um, suburban areas and, and a pretty dead city core with uh, high rise office buildings. And this was clearly not what people had been asking for and share an idea. So then when um, the city had to develop the plan, all of these big engineering companies and, and um, entrepreneur companies and so on, they, um, they wanted to reintroduce what they had before. And they had a lot of money behind them. They had a lot of also national power in terms of politicians that were supporting that. Also because they wanted to um, boost the GDP and this would, would be a GDP booster. But, um, but that became a very difficult struggle for them because local politicians and activists had this share an idea and they said, well, this is what you promised us. You asked us for our opinion. We gave us your, we gave your, our opinion and, and now you have to listen. So I, I think that this is the power of, of doing something like that. It's, it's really about arguments. What um, Jan Gehl did in New York was very, very simple. They went into Times Square, they calculated how many people move through Times Squares by car how many people move by foot? I think it was around 90% of the people that moved through Times Square, they were on foot. Yeah. yeah. But 80% of the area were devoted to cars. And that became a very understandable argument to a lot of people where this was sort of raised the question, is this fair? Why do we give so little priority to pedestrians? And in that sense, it's, it's always about being able to frame the winning argument. And when, when you're up against money interest, that can be very hard. But um, the case of Christchurch is a very good example of something that actually was very uh, effect, effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we have a few questions uh, coming in. Maybe we can take some of those. Uh, yeah, I'll read out the first one. Uh, thank you for the film. I quite enjoyed it. I was wondering, though, what it was like filming in China and Bangladesh, given your own location as someone from Northern Europe and a different cultural context. Were there moments during the filming when you felt you got an insight into something that you could take back to the geography that you came from? <laughs> um, well, they're, they're very different experiences, those two cities. I've been a lot to China before, so I've been filming a lot in China and and um, that was um, was maybe not for me the most interesting experience making this city uh, as opposed to Dhaka, which for me was a whole new experience. It, mm -hmm. It's such a, such a dramatic city and, and, and fascinating because it's like you, you exit the airport and there's a lawn in front of the airport. And I think I counted 300 people just hanging out there on the lawn. And, and it was that experience of wherever I looked, I could count more people than I could probably find in a football stadium in Denmark. That, that constant sort of saturation of people was, was really, um, really intense. And at the same time, there are certain aspects of Dhaka that, that, that are very close to Copenhagen. Like there's a lot of public life, there's a lot of life on the street, there's a lot of bikes, rickshaws. Um, so, um, Dhaka was, was a really, really intense um, experience. More than anything, it was uh, also really, really hot. And um, it was in, in, in the hot part of the season and okay. uh, traffic is already at a point in Dhaka where you can spend three hours just moving from one neighborhood to another by car. It's, it's, um, it's a city with a lot of problems. Um, and, and it's a city where um, these activists that we meet in the film, they, um, 
they don't have much of a voice. It's it's really um, other kinds of powers that are that are ruling it right now. At least when when we were filming, it's a few years ago. So hopefully it's changed. But um, but it was um, at the same time also really rewarding to see that that the same kind of problems are relevant to people in Dhaka, that uh, are relevant in Copenhagen. And in that sense, it's it's a shared struggle. Um, that, that we see in cities everywhere. This, this film has been a, a big success in the sense that it's traveled to many, many countries. It's been filmed and screened many times. We sit here, the film was made in 2012. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that the reason is that it's relevant for people everywhere to discuss these issues. And this film can be a tool. It can create awareness about um, these questions and, and that's useful. So the next question we have, uh, hi, the narrative device of the film, breaking each city into a chapter, which works well as you have shot in the global south and north. Were you tempted to tempted during the edit to provide more context to each city that you were shooting in as New York is different from Melbourne, which is different from Dhaka and so on? There's always a ton of information that I want to put in a film that I can't fit into a film of 90, 80 minutes. So um, that's that's part of the um, the struggle of being a filmmaker because um, there's there's so much that I get passionate about along the way that I can't fit into a film. Um, at the same time, it was from the outset the idea that this film should be looking at the world and the urban experience through the eyes of Jan Gehl and the kind of theories and thinking that he's developed regarding cities. And in that sense, it's it's really sort of mapping the world and showing that these questions are very similar, no matter where you go, there are local solutions to it. But the basic principles um, are, are not that different. And we developed um, a way to film a kind of, um, you can say sort of pattern that we were using for every um, every image basically, so that you can cut from one part of the world to another part of the world, mm -hmm. but see it with a bit of similar eyes. Um, so it's very much in the framing of the images, uh, where we put the camera and and how we portray the urban experience. And and that was, um, we used a Finnish photographer, a brilliant one called Heike, who um, was there on, on most of the shoots and, and really worked with this method to um, make sure that we could basically um, create a language about the urban experience across the world. There's a funny experience from Dhaka. You mentioned um, what, what was um, interesting about Dhaka. Then I think the biggest challenge was to be able to film without having 100 people looking into the camera. So um, so we would always develop in Dhaka. We developed a method in Dhaka where we put the camera on one side and we had our local team like surrounding the camera so to make it almost invisible. Okay. And then I would stand on the other side of the road. And then when we knew we would film like 20 seconds, I would then yell like crazy and make like funny noises and dances. And then everybody would look in that direction. And then for those 20 seconds, it would appear <laughs> that people were looking into the camera. Okay. okay. So yeah, in a way, a somewhat related question, I guess. Absolutely love the documentary and how well articulated it is. I wanted to know more about the street footage from different cities and how consent works in the case of documentaries where the scale is so big. And also what was the process of funding for this film? Um, how the consent works? Yeah, I, I think uh, it, the point is about how do you take consent when like you do interviews and so on in this case, how do you go about the ethical aspects of filming? Right. Um, well, filming on, on streets in public areas are generally worldwide something that you're allowed to do. Um, you cannot walk into people's private homes without their consent. Right. To film in public, um, street life, for example, is um, something where you don't need people's individual consent. So that's how we dealt with that. Um, 
regarding uh, the funding. This was funded by a um, Danish organization and it's a foundation called Real Dania who came to me and said, would you like to do a film on this topic? And I had already been in contact with them. We knew each other. So um, the, the foundation is quite interesting. It's, it's fundamentally a um, company that was divided as a sort of co uh, created as a co-op where um, they delivered um, loans to people to pay mortgage or to buy homes. Oh. So it's um, it's like Fannie Mae in, in mm -hmm. the US. Um, and over the years, this became a very big company, but it was basically owned by everyone who was a customer of it um, in principle. So um, at some point, they decided that this company should be privatized and sold off to um, another company. And that when it was sold, it created a fortune of several billion dollars that was basically owned by every customer of the company. Yeah. And instead of dividing the money out to the customers, what they decided was to uh, create a foundation that would work towards improving um, planning, architecture, and um, everything related to building. And this foundation does a lot of good work in Denmark to improve architecture, to improve urban planning, and also, um, they were the ones who um, basically funded this film. That's really interesting. So the next question is, making cities walkable, making the public space as a space of leisure is great and something for most of us to think about. But I also wonder is, if this desire is related to class and access. For example, the voice of the taxi driver in the New York section sounds like a South Asian immigrant male. His objection to closing off roads may also come from the fact that it affects his livelihood. How do we then think of these concerns that the taxi, taxi is also a form of livelihood for many people? It's a very good question. And in the case of New York, I, I think he was Pakistani. Mm -hmm. um, and and there's a kind of two things, two aspects to it. One is what you can call maybe a, a general shared conservatism amongst citizens to change their city. And, and that's something that we see everywhere where people tend to think that the way that their city looks is something that's how it should be and how it has always been. When we change a city, then we very use very fast get used to get adapted to this new kind of situation. But to change it is something that people struggle to, 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 to deal with, to, to imagine. Um, in the case of New York, I think it was really um, these um, sort of guerrilla type projects where they temporarily blocked off some streets and showed that, well, the city can still work even though we do this. And suddenly when they had done this over the summer for two or three months, the citizen wanted it to stay this way. Yeah. So this sort of change of mindset is, is, is a, a, a challenge everywhere and with all levels of society. Then there's the very particular thing that when you change the city, you of course challenge certain people's livelihoods. It could be a taxi driver. It could be someone who has a shop, but you also uh, most often you, you, generate new types of livelihoods. So um, that that's part of the, the struggle with change and it, it can be uh, bad, but it can also uh, be good. It, it's, it's, a more, it's a quite difficult discussion, I think, because in the case of blocking off streets, yes, you may make the life of taxi drivers a bit more difficult. You may move some people out of taxis and onto bikes. Mm -hmm. Um, but it also offers a cheap way of transporting yourself to people who can afford a taxi. So, um, so it can also improve the life of the poor people. Then also, I have a good, I think a good example that I know from Copenhagen was a particular street in a particular part of the city that um, had a lot of shops there. And they wanted to um, close the street off from traffic and and all the shopkeepers they were so angry because they said you're going to destroy our livelihoods 
this was also a lot of um, shawarma um, makers from Turkey. And I mean, this was not rich shopkeepers. And, and then um, they forced the change through, they removed traffic from the street, but they made, it, made a calculation before and after how many people per day were walking through the street. Mm -hmm. And after they made the change, they showed that there were significantly more people moving through the street total, if you combine cars and, and walking and bikes, significantly more. And also they could show that the chance that someone on foot will enter into a shop and actually buy something is far greater than if you're in a car. So the result for the shopkeepers was a significant increase in revenue. And um, so, so sometimes this conservatism is also um, very understandably related to, will my life change for the worse? But oftentimes if we look at, at sort of the lives of the shops, uh, that improves a lot when, um, when you make these urban changes. Uh, there's a question about how did you shoot the scenes with regard to timelines, especially scenes that juxtapose the past stories with the present? Um, maybe they're referring to especially some of those scenes where you sh show the transition and not entirely show. We had a um, CGI team of 200 people in, in Bangladesh. <laughs> no. uh, we, um, a lot of these images were basically, they're available, they are publicly available. They were made by, in the case of New York, by the city of New York to document the changes. So um, then we um, did a lot of research. We found images before and after we found images that, that matched up. And then ourselves, we went out and with the camera, we, we did images with exactly the same framing okay. that we then, so we could, could really show the change in time. And and that's something that I did for the film from Bogota also. And, and I think that it's, it's incredibly effective because when something has been built, when a change has been implemented, like I said, people get used to it in three months. They forget about it. They forget what was there before. Yeah. And, and this is a very effective way of re reminding people, look, your life really changed. So, yeah, uh, the next question is, you trained as a fiction filmmaker, but you've also made non-fiction films and a hybrid film. Could you tell us a little bit more about the hybrid film and what you feel about these categories? Um, categories here, meaning what we call fiction, non-fiction, and, and its meaning in your filmmaking practice. Um, I really take it story by story. Some stories fit one type, another fit another type. Um, in the sense that whenever I work, I think what's fundamental in my way of working is to think as an anthropologist. That's what I trained as initially. And it's somehow stayed with me in the sense that I try to do through a lot of research and through being present where I'm filming to gain an understanding of the inside perspective and if I make a film from Bogota, I try to really understand how do the people that I'm filming understand their challenges, their life. And then I try to find ways to communicate that to others. In the case of this film, The Human Scale, I um, developed a, a very close relationship to um, Jan Gale and like-minded architects. And I try to really understand mm -hmm. on a deeper level, something that they worked 40 years to achieve an understanding of. And of course, I, I can never gain their level of expertise. But um, if I get to some level of understanding it, then because I also am a filmmaker, and I think visually, and I use sound and images and music and so on, and uh, I can find ways to communicate what they know in new ways, and in um, maybe a more engaging way as well. Yeah. Um, so at the same time, of course, I have my own ideas that I want to put on a film. Uh, like I said, I've thought a lot about the 20th century and modernism and so on. So for me, meeting Jan Gale was also meeting someone with, with like-minded ideas. 
that I felt compelled to communicate to the world. Um, and at the same time, it is really, it's this inside out kind of perspective, which I think is fundamentally very much what an anthropologist does. A journalist is much more um, outside in, you could say. Okay. Um, my first film was from Afghanistan and I spent many, many months with the subjects. They were bodybuilders. It was about bodybuilding in Afghanistan, which is a pretty big sport. And, um, and really trying to understand how do they perceive the world and can I find a way to communicate that? Of course, I can never communicate or understand that fully, but, um, but at least I, I can try. And I experienced a lot of journalists at the time. This was from 2002 to 2007 that we filmed that film. A lot of journalists would come to Afghanistan in a very short amount of time. Their editor would have more or less a headline developed for them beforehand. And then they would go out and they would find content to fit into that headline. Um, whereas an anthropologist, you work very much the other way around. You, you come with the idea of a blank slate and then you get the impressions and then you start to develop a story through that. And that has ever since become very essential to how I work. And if I do it as a fiction film, well, then it's going into the story and the character and really finding a way to communicate their emotional life and challenges to, to the world. But as a documentary filmmaker, it's, 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 very, it's very much the same for me. And in the case of a hybrid, well, you can use fictional tools, you can use documentary, uh, you can use real life, you can use actors, or you can use a real life person who acts in as himself in his own life yeah. uh, and I mean for me you can use any kind of tool what's what's important is that the audience can to some degree um, understand the kind of tools you're making so they don't feel manipulated but they are in on the storytelling and enjoy the way that the story is being told because I think the problem is when, when, when as an audience you feel manipulated into some kind of um, thing, whether it's true or not, just the sense of being and feeling manipulated is, um, is uh, going to turn people off. I think we're almost out of time. Here is one last question. Should we be expecting sequels to this movie? as in more chapters from other countries like Japan, et cetera, I would love to know, I guess, or, or do you have any other movies which uh, you, through which you intend to focus more on cities coming up? Um, I don't have any current plans right now um, to do a second, the human scale on cities. Uh, I produced a film from um, Calcutta about, okay. um, heritage buildings and it was about this former Danish uh, town in outside of Calcutta that was a trading station back in the 17 something mm -hmm. and then was taken over by the British and um, and now the Danish National Museum is um, trying to get some of these old buildings restored and it's called Serampore the city and it's um, the, the film was dealing with the whole question about, and, and I think that that's a question that's being discussed a lot in India. What do you do with these old colonial buildings? Yeah. Are they worth preserving? Is it a history worth remembering? And, um, and uh, we see it in the US in terms of these statues of uh, Confederate generals and so yeah. on. Should they just tear down their history because it's um, a rather bleak history? Or, um, or what do you do? And, um, and, and we did a film, film on that. Um, so um, so I've, I've dealt with these planning issues since. I also made a film that I really recommend, which is on the countryside. It's called Redane, R-E-D-A-N-E. -E. It's only 14 minutes long, but it's about the countryside. Okay. Because we did a very similar thing to the countryside as we did to cities in the 20th century. Okay. The countryside became also something we thought of as a factory and as something that should be effectivized. And as today in Denmark, what we really see the countryside 
has the countryside has become a production house, a factory for the pig industry more than anything. So uh, Denmark is one of the biggest producers of pigs in the world, and it's a very intensely cultivated country in terms of agriculture. So if you take the, the total land mass of Denmark, then 62% of the total land mass is cultivated land for agriculture. Really? Okay. That's a lot. It's one of the most intensely uh, cultivated countries in the world. But two thirds of this is actually used for the pig industry. Oh. And what it's done to the countryside is that more and more we see these pig factories that are not very labor intensive. There are very few people working there. The countryside is, is emptied out. And there is a social backlash to this because uh, where cities are growing economically and people get richer and houses, the wealth that you, when you own a house, they grow in value. It's the opposite thing that happens in the countryside. And we see that in many places around the world where there is, there is really a sort of social disaster happening in the countryside because you have these very few factories that produce food and everything in between is, is emptied out, jobs are lost. And, and if we have to rethink that, we have to rethink the whole economic model on how we produce food. And we have to produce food in, in a much more labor intensive way where we produce higher quality and less uh, eat less meat and produce higher quality meat. I mean, these would be solutions that would really remake the countryside as well. So this, this film talks a lot about that. Um, and then currently I'm now um, starting a project and we're moving into production where we talk about how to reintroduce the human to tech. Okay. Because this idea about development and the future and science fiction and so on is very much permeating the whole Silicon Valley culture where um, you, um, if you take people like Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, um, they're some of the richest people on the planet now. They own the most powerful companies, the biggest companies in the world. And they are investing a lot of money into building bunkers that can protect them if the apocalypse happens or build base spaceships so they can move to Mars. And what we're really gonna try to look into in that film is that somehow humans were forgotten in this whole process. How could these companies rather than use humans as users on their platforms to exploit for data or um, for commercials or for whatever, how, how could how could they do something that benefits humans? And, and really trying to, in that sense, take the thinking of the human scale when it comes to cities and say, can we do the same with tech? And, um, and challenge the, um, the way things are going right now because it's not going, going very well. That's really interesting because like you said, it does take this whole idea, which we started talking about the, the importance of these ideas in a way, in your own work, this one idea, how it transitions to an entirely different domain would be really interesting to see. I think, unfortunately, we are completely out of time. It's been great talking to you and thank you so much for a wonderful movie. Uh, thanks so much, Andreas. I will hand it over to Yasho to conclude. Thank you so much, Andres, for not only sharing the film with us, but also joining us on uh, a Sunday morning for you. Um, I mean, it's, it's still the morning for you. Uh, we've screened Cities of Speed before at our festival. Uh, and at that point, we couldn't get you for a conversation. So I'm more glad now that uh, we've been able to screen uh, the human scale and also um, have you join us. Um, I hope we're able to screen more of your films at our festival in the future. And if you're, uh, if possible, maybe even have you join us for the conversation in person. Um, thank you, Krishna, for agreeing to the to do this conversation. It's always good to have you at the festival. Um, once again, I'd like to thank our festival partners, the Danish Cultural Institute, for making this possible. Um, thanks to everyone in the audience who's joined us and for participating. Um, our next conversation starts shortly at 5 p.m. IST. Uh, we have Sanji, uh, Sanjeev Shah, who will talk uh, about his film, Hun Hunshi Hunshilal. Um, he will be in conversation with filmmaker Bar um, uh, and cinematographer Avijit Mukul Kishore. I hope to see you all then. Thank you.